academic session. We have with us Dr. Unni Krishnan, Medical Director and Senior Consultant, VR Diseases, UVR, Neuroophthalmology and Electrodiagnostics in the Chaitanya Group of Hospitals and Research Institute. And he's going to be elaborating on the algorithmic approach for OCT-based treatment for AMD. We look forward to hearing you, Dr. Unni Nair. Thank you, ma'am, for the invitation. And uh, thanks to Srinivas also for giving me actually quite a difficult topic. I'll just start my screen share. So, uh, so um, I'll be talking about the algorithmic approach using OCT uh, for uh, di uh, in uh, AMD. So, uh, I'm, we'll be dealing with this in three parts. That is the use of algorithms for diagnosis, initiating, propagating, and terminating treatment, and uh, evaluating prognosis. So, when it comes to diagnosis, the first point I'd like to say is that do we really know the need to know the clinic, uh, clinical scenario of the patient while we try to attempt to create a, a OCT algorithm? Because as you see in some of these uh, cases, it's very obvious that the disease process is AMD and uh, uh, it's very obvious most of the times that there's only one line of treatment you tend to follow and that's anti -vigil. So what is the purpose? Let, let's uh, try to answer this. So the a point of uh, diagnosis is important using the OCT to know the location, whether it's foveal or non-foveal, or is it foveal by extension, by uh, blood or uh, the activity of the disease? Obviously, the type, whether it is a pre-RP disease, post-RP, or whether it is uh, an extensive disease. The activity, is it currently, obviously, is it currently active? Uh, that too, is it an overt activity or a smoldering activity? Or is it totally inactive? Are we dealing with a typical AMD or are we dealing with uh, a variant of the disease? And the duration, is it a new disease? Is it a reactivation? or is it just a chronic disease that has never gone away totally? Coming specifically to looking at the type of disease with uh, the OCT, you want to know whether the membrane is a pre-RP or a post-RP. And if it's a pre-RP membrane, the concentration is as to whether to uh, find out whether it's a PC or a non-PCV disease. If it's a type two membrane, you want to know whether it's very focal or whether it's diffuse. And uh, I've added two uh, things at the end, that is a uh, vascular SHLM and avascular, we'll come to that a bit later. In an extensive membrane where you might not be able to differentiate between a type two and a type one, you, it's interesting to know whether it's a breakthrough in a smaller area or it's a large area where there are multiple areas of the different types of uh, locations. And of course, there's a type three membrane, which has got a, uh, the retinal angiometrous proliferation, which has a lot of retinal activities. Cystoid macular edema and uh, treatment is sometimes difficult and ends with extensive atrophy. So what is what do we need to know about initiating treatment and propagating? So here is where the uh, I think the algorithm starts. If it's a typical AMD with signs of uh, activity, you can probably initiate treatment immediately. This does not mean uh, without the necessary investigations, but sometimes you uh, are uh, at liberty to just start treatment. But when do you defer the initiation sometimes? When you have minimal activity and you may observe the patient if you're uh, for that. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the colorful diamond over there uh, interposes sometimes whenever I think oct octa is or OCT angiography is going to be useful. So this is such a patient where you have an elevation over there and octa reveals that there is a vascular network underneath that small elevation or what we call a non-exudative uh, CNBM. Which, which uh, there's, a roughly, there's roughly a 20% chance of going to an overt uh, membrane. So there is also cases where you have doubtful uh, activity. Can you please, uh, in the background, can you please be muted? Thank you. So there's conditions where you have doubtful activity, that you have this small amount of elevation between PEDs or between Lucent. And some, in this case also, Octa is useful. Here you can see this patient has been followed for nearly six years. First, there's an, uh, the, uh, the PD elevates and between the PD, there's a slight draping of the retina. And it's hard to say whether it is SRF or it's physically the retina is just not touching the RP over there. This patient over a six year follow-up and obviously no vascular network on the Octa was uh, highlighted what I just said, a doubtful activity which could be monitored by Octa. And then you have the case of your doubtful diagnosis, where you need to do a little bit more investigations, uh, tailor-made investigations sometimes before you start or initiate treatment. 
uh, cases like adult vitelliform degenerations that sometimes look like CNBMs and autofluorescence uh, sometimes is really helpful. So let's go to the point of propagation of treatment. So we all start with something called loading dose. I like to call it induction rather than loading dose, which means whatever it takes to reduce the activity to a plateau phase. And from there, you go to the next phase. That is how the OCT helps you. Assessing whether the patient has got uh, what I like to call less aggressive features or highly aggressive features. The less aggressive features would be SRF and uh, the condition called multilayer. And highly aggressive features would be the SHRM or the subretinal hyperreflective material, lots of cystoid macular edema, large, extremely large PEDs and macular involvement of the RPE disease, not the retinal disease, the RPE disease. And therefore, the decision of maintenance comes with that. So this is an example of multi-layering. You see the spindle-like layering underneath the RPE, which shows, I wouldn't say an indolent or mild disease, but a disease which does not have a tendency to go into high extremes of rips and bleeding and all those things, and is a slightly more, uh, as, uh, in some uh, articles mentioned it as a beneficial disease. A variation of the multi-layering is called multi-lamination or having laminate bodies. And this is the other extreme, the highly aggressive feature of having an extra large PED, which, is which has a tendency to rips and bleeds. So when you talk about maintenance, based on these signs, you have two forms of maintenance, what we call PRN and TE. I like to call it reactive and proactive. You call a PRN regime reactive because you're looking for OCT evidence. It actually happens when there's an escape from disease control, and that's the PRN. And then you have the proactive, that is you do a treat and extend we are actually you're ensuring that there is absence of disease activity and therefore you maintain the disease under better control. And this is an OCT based uh, maintenance algorithm. So the aim of treatment of A and B is not to treat the OCT. Let me be very clear about that. It's to prevent a long-term visual drop, prevent large subretinal bleeds, identify chronic SRF, and obviously identify whether any disease that comes is new or contiguous. How about stopping treatment? You can, if you have the ability to stop treatment, which sometimes doesn't happen in AMD, there is the question of aggressive monitoring and less aggressive monitoring after that. And all of this is based on the OCT science, the amount of RP atrophy, the, the compact compactness of the scar that forms inside. One Whether minute is, remaining. Okay. And these are the conditions where you see whether you accept activity, stable SR, degenerative CME. So this patient had a SRF for a very long time and you could deem that you could watch the patient. This is an example where there's degenerative CME of the scar and you stop treatment aggressively so that uh, you can get on with observing the patient. So the, what makes you retreat the patient? And one of the best examples is a recurrence of a PED after observation for a long time. Here you see the reappearance of the PED is a sign for you to go back to monthly anti therapy sometimes. So these are the points I'd like to say about evaluating prognosis. You have to look at the location, as I said, the nature of the disease. This is an example of PCV and a type three, which have a slightly poorer prognosis. SHRM, uh, vascular SHRM or hyperreflective metal on the OCTA shows a flow signal inside and has a poorer prognosis because it's a part of the disease process per se and not just exudation. And this is another example. And this is an example where the SHRM doesn't have a flow signal and it's probably going to go away and it's probably blood sometimes. Multilayering, as I said, when present has a beneficial, uh, beneficial. Sir, time is up, sir. I've got two more slides and I'll just complete this. So the scar with overlying degenerative CME is an example where uh, it's, a, it's an indication that you can stop and cease treatment and you can just observe the patient because that CME is not going to go away. The atrophy associated, whether it is secondary to the CNVM or there is extensive geographic atrophy uh, even before the uh, choroidal process. And lastly, I'd like to say, this is something we don't look at very often, the choroidal feature, especially leptochoroid. This is an example of a patient who had uh, a CNVM disease. However, the choroid is extremely thin and this patient went into RP, extreme RP atrophy after the treatment with uh, anti was completed. So OCT has not only revolutionized what we understand, it's our, our, basically our understanding, and that is how we are able to actually at least attempt to put in some algorithms over. So thank you for uh, patient listening and sorry for the slight increase in uh, time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uni. It was such a wonderful talk. I learned so much. Leave alone the rest. Uh, so Srinivas, one to you. Yeah, uh, Uni sir, uh, fantastic presentation as always. The another point where we are seeing is if there is increase in the height of the DLS, 
does it act like a surrogate marker for the the disease activity that it's going to get reactivated again is one point and second point when you said about these degenerative changes over the scar we had a few patients where it looked like a very sketic kind of uh, both in the outer retinal as well as inner retinal layers almost like the similar configuration of the degenerative but these newer anti measures even they are uh, getting disappeared sometimes so when do we really call them as a degenerative structure do we should we give a try on these uh, kind of anti measures and then uh, say it or just on morphological features we have to ascertain so there are some morphological features that uh, define degenerative cme uh, like uh, being extremely involved and overlying the lesion now let's get things very clear the some of these some of the times these disappear with anti vegf but the key word is that it's very fleeting or temporary and they tend to come back and why if you know the uh, if we can uh, realize a reason for the degenerative it is a component of having an rp decompensation also or a blood retinal barrier breakdown not only the anti permeability factor or the not only the permeability from the cmdm over there so uh, if you uh, at stage number 1 if you want to define degenerative cme that uh, cme that does not go with anti vegf you probably also have to define it as something that comes back immediately after you see anti vegf therapy also and what regarding the dls what well, dls yeah yeah go ahead so, uh, the dls as you said the vertical height increase the lateral extension has been described by a few papers a vertical height is obviously material getting collected underneath the dls so I, now Uh, now uh, having speculation regarding whether you can call it a surrogate marker but we are eventually going into the time where this is going to be one of the best uses for oct angiography to identify vascular member mem- membrane so yes it is a surrogate uh, we should be using more accurate tools to say whether it's increasing a very small question what is the importance of uh, intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid in amd so uh, this is the favorite debate going based on one paper that has come out uh, and everybody has stuck is uh, calling hallelujah for subretinal fluid anyway so there is no good subretinal <coughs> fluid no it is all good all subretinal fluid is bad it's just that uh, the question here is tolerable now there is the concept of tolerating some amount of subretinal fluid and saying it's okay rather than pushing anti vegf but you are not supposed to tolerate any intraretinal fluid so that is the that is the simplest gist of the matter uh, it, uh should we go on to our next speaker or anything to add uh, srinivas yeah any expert panel want to add a quick comment or uh, we can go to the next yeah hi shri uh one of the things that i'd like to say is that though uh, what the speaker said is very true that we never treat the oct actually and we are treating the disease but it is also true that in oct angiography unlike in cross sectional oct you are able to identify the either the active vessels or the dying vessels or the stable vessels so what i do is i continue to treat even if there is no fluid but if i see the vessels there and on the oct angiogram then i would tend to treat at least for one or more sessions till i find that the vessels have become stable so either they are not responding any further to the treatment but if they are responding to the treatment we treat continue to treat because basically fluid is just a marker for an activity in the disease in the diseased vessel but if the vessel itself has died down and has become just a ghost vessel then i will stop treatment so that's why i i believe that the oct angiogram actually is much more important than doing just the oct and identifying fluid Uh, i think that's a great point i just like to just mention one thing i absolutely think that's a great point but each time i see an oct angiography i pray and hope that what i'm seeing is actually there <laughs> that's so true <laughs> okay. that's a progression is so important on that yeah. or, or regression okay. whatever okay you know? reema madam pick reema yeah. madam go ahead so, uh, to answer ma'am's question dr chitra's question subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid So intraretinal fluid is even a worse biomarker uh, for CMV. So if we see intraretinal fluid, that's a bad sign. And secondly, um, the thought on the OCT angio, I somehow feel these vessels never regress completely. So the fibrotic complex always remains. It's just a matter whether it's leaking or not uh, that comes up on the OCT. Yeah, 